I think that was a really brilliant introduction from our comrades in Australia and France. Um, and to be honest, to follow on from that, I did want to talk about um, the global revolts and what's been happening around the world because, um, you know, I think what an exciting time the last year has been. Um, just to name a couple of uh, examples, you know, to see, you know, over a million people on the, taking to the streets of um, Santiago calling for more than just reforms, but an end to neoliberalism um, has been amazing and inspiring. You know, through general strikes and mass protests, um, people in Chile have reminded us how, you know, workers' power and mass struggles can shut down business as usual. Or you think about uh, Lebanon as another example. You know, people have overcome religious and sectarian divisions um, out of sharing an anger at the ruling classes for years of the austerity that they've endured. Um, and all of this while the rich and the politicians continue to get richer at their expense. Um, or you can even just rewind to the summer when two long-standing dictators were dicta uh, toppled, actually not over the summer, in a month even, um, the first of which was Abdelaziz uh, Bouteflika in Algeria, who'd been in power for 20 years, um, toppled uh, at the beginning of April. And little over a week later, um, Omar al-Bashir, who'd been in power for even longer, 30 years in Sudan, um, was removed from power um, after mass protests and sit-ins in the country. Um, but it's not just um, in in places uh, like Africa uh, and Middle East and Latin America. I mean, you think about, you know, um, what's been going on in India in the last couple of months. You know, it wasn't very long ago where we saw in India um, the biggest uh, uh, strike in its, in its history, 250 million workers uh, coming out in January, um, not just over things like pay and um, working conditions and so on, but actually, you know, they were joining protests and student occupations that were resisting Modi's incredibly racist and incredibly divisive citizenship laws. Um, and lastly, I do want to mention uh, France. Um, how can you not after uh, what ja uh, Jad was saying? I mean, you know, you know, the mass revolts and strikes uh, that we've been seeing in these cities, um, well, I was going to say before that they've been the biggest since the 1990s, but I stand corrected. You know, comrades are saying that actually, you know, the sort of strike movement we're seeing at the moment in France is, is something that is comparable to, to 68, which I think really says something. Um, and this has come out of workers striking um, in key sectors like uh, transport and so on, um, and really bringing the country to a standstill. Um, and I think why you can't say well, you can't say that these uprisings are necessarily very deliberately coordinated um, with one another, although they certainly do uh, take inspiration from one another. Um, you know, they all share common characteristics, you know, deep rooted social and economic anger, um, a feeling that the political structures, the politicians, the government aren't on their side. Um, you know, these are from the same governments that push through brutal cuts and increased taxes um, on people who are already struggling to make ends meet. Um, but also it's come out of uh, frustration at the growing inequality in society, and rightly so. I mean, Oxfam, a year or two ago, um, released a statistic that was uh, uh, released a report that showed that you know the six, 62 billionaires uh 62 of the top billionaires in the world have the same wealth as the bottom 3.6 million half of the the world that's a staggering um amount and you know that report was published perhaps two years ago so i'd imagine you know that that uh that inequality is a lot bigger um and deeper today um now, as revolutionaries, um, I think we should celebrate the uprisings um, around the world and any struggle from below um, against business as usual. Um, but I think as well, it's worth saying that's not just to be cheerleaders or, you know, talk about these struggles as a matter of curiosity or interest. I think we ought to draw um, lessons and learn from these struggles around the world. Um, firstly, I think it's worth saying that the fact that the fact that the biggest struggles uh, to change the status quo um, in the world have been led by black and brown people in different parts of the world, usually uh, a lot of the time with women at the fore, whether that's in places like Sudan, whether that's in India, whether that's in Haiti, um, absolutely smashes you know, the racist stereotypes we hear um, over here in Britain and, and elsewhere in the West, you know, things like uh, black people are, are criminals or Muslims are terrorists or even uh, that Muslim women are traditionally um, submissive uh so sorry yeah uh lost my page um 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it absolutely smashes the racist stereotype um, that we have pumped out of the media and, and the establishment uh, constantly here. Um, and I think we, you know, we should think on how uh, we th we should think about how we take on racism here. Uh, uh, in mentioning that, you know, I think it's absolutely disgusting that you know the charter flights have continued, um, and we know that it's only the beginning of you know uh, Johnson's attacks on migrants and and refugees. Um, and that's why I think UN uh, Anti Racism Day on the twenty first of March is so important important um, and I don't just want people to join that demonstration but I think people should go away thinking about who they can bring um, along to it uh, as well. But I think um, going back to the gro uh, global revolts I'd argue that you know, they share the same roots um, as the rise in racism and, and far-right forces around the world and, and authoritarian regimes. Um, and that root cause, I'd say, is the fact that since the economic crash, um, you know, we haven't, there's been no uh, growth. There's, all we've seen is stagnation. And what that's meant is that the poorest people in society have been having to pay for it. You know, what we're seeing is a crisis um, in neoliberalism. And people are sick of paying the price for the economic chaos at the top of society. You know, their falling living standards um, or the fact that there's little jobs or opportunities for young people, even though, you know, people can be highly qualified and, and the rest of it. Um, and I think as well, it's worth saying that, you know, that doesn't just, that can either manifest in progressive mass struggles, um, even the resurgence of socialist ideas like we're seeing um, around the world, but that can also be pulled um, to the right and by the far right. Um, and just to name a few examples that I think show this is, for example, um, France, the same France that you know, has allowed, uh, you know, Marine Le Pen and the Front National to become one of the biggest uh, parties um, in France is the same France where we've seen, you know, the militant Yellow Vest movement and now the, the strike movement happening um, in the big cities. Or even you think about uh, the uh, mass uh, strikes and protests we saw in India, that's obviously happening at the same time of the context of uh, the rise in the BA BJP and, and Modi. Um, I think another example that shows this um, it is what's going on in the United States at the moment. We've seen how uh, it, you know there's anger that's being pulled to the right in the form of Trump, in the form of you know absolute tragedies like the Pittsburgh uh, massacre, like Charlottesville, and so on. But at the same time, that same that same country um, has seen you know the uh, the rise of, for example, the Democratic Socialists of America. You know the massive women's marches that had happened when Trump had first been elected, and now you know Bernie Sanders could very well be um, the next. Uh, US president and you know he's definitely got by far you know one of the most uh, young and enthusiastic uh, presidential election campaigns in democratic um, history and we saw some of that enthusiasm and that excitement um, around Corbyn as we've uh, just been discussing um, and so I don't want to talk too much about it um, but I think it's um, worth saying that while people might be disheartened with the election results and so on um, it's worth pointing out two things and that firstly is that Johnson and the Tories while they may feel triumphant with their new majority and so on um, and you know let's be honest they will be able to push through whatever they want in parliament their problems haven't at all gone away um, all the leading economists are saying that there will be another recession later in the year um, and Johnson's strategy of cuts covered by, you know, scapegoating migrants and, and the likes isn't isn't going to cut it at all. And he has a new electoral base um, to, to answer to, um, which changes things. And also, I think it's worth saying that, you know, the Financial Times and the Times um, in the over the course of the election campaign weren't, for, weren't at all, uh, you know, a, a, uh, pushing for the Tories or the Conservatives um, to be elected at all. Clearly, you know, it's the voice of big business and so on aren't necessarily seeing Boris Johnson either as their guy. So I don't think his problems um, have gone away and this is something that we can exploit. Um, but I think the second reason as well is that the uh, global revolts remind us that politics doesn't end at elections at all um, or Parliament. And we shouldn't be waiting till 2024 for another election to challenge things like austerity, inequality, racism, uh, climate change and the rest of it. In fact, climate change shows we don't have the time to afford uh, to wait for elections or wait for anything. Um, 
And really, I think that means we need to resist and organize now. Um, that means defending migrants and refugees uh, whenever they're targeted and attacked. That means supporting every strike um, and action in the workplaces. Um, and I think it's really exciting that the UCU are going to go be going on another 14 days of strike actions. And if you're a student, which I'd, I'm assuming most people here are, it's worth thinking what you can do um, to support that strike, what you can do to mobilize uh, support for it and bring our unis to a standstill. Um, and lastly, I think that means means building the movements that take on things like the hostile environment, the attacks on the NHS that take on things like climate change um, and so on. I'm just going to um, end with this. Um, I mean, I think all of these struggles, all of these uh, smaller struggles are important and it's through these smaller struggles that people actually gain the confidence to change uh, soci the societies we live in and, you know, to return to the global revolts, you can sort of see that in how these big generalized struggles start off, you know, in Lebanon, the uprisings we saw were sparked by attacks on WhatsApp. Um, the government knew turned on this, and they, they, that's not the sole cause of the uprisings, that's the spark. The government retreated on this, Actually, it didn't, mean, it didn't mean that people went back home. It meant that people carried on uh, demonstrating in the streets, escalated action, because actually it showed them that they can win um, something and, and the sort of power that they have. Mm -hmm. Similarly in Sudan, um, and I promise I'm summing up here, you know, the, uh, what sparked the <coughs> toppling of the uh, dictator, the, the uprising um, that caused that was attacks on fuel. The government retreats on that once the uprising um, is in full swing. People don't go back home. Bashir is uh, toppled out of power. People still don't go back home. They can see that they can topple a dictator. And they start saying they want a completely different regime. They want a completely different political structure. And so the small fights are incredibly important because people's ideas change through them. Um, and every win is absolutely worth it. And I think all of this shows the way uh, the way we can win uh, a different, the way we can fight and win uh, a different type of society, how we can uh, fight and win um, socialist socialist uh, change and so on. Um, but I think none of this is automatic. You know, it takes revolutionaries and radicals arguing um, and agitating in their workplaces, in their communities, um, <clears throat> in their campuses, a lot like what Jasmine was actually talking about um, in the discussion and what she's doing in her own uh, workplace. And and I think if you agree with that and you want to be part of building that resistance, then you should think about joining the Socialist Worker Party. Look, I want to start with a question. Um, who here has heard of a woman called Rosa Luxemburg? Do you want to put up your hand if you have? Okay. Uh, there's some people who haven't. You should buy the Rebel's Guide about her um, to find out more about her. The reason I start with her is because I wanted to start with a cliché. Um, I quite like cliches. I think they cheer you up a bit um, and make you feel a bit better. Um, Rosa Luxemburg said something which has, in the hundred years since she said it, it's become a cliche of the socialist movement. Uh, it's often repeated. What she said is, is that society faces, cho faces a choice between, on the one hand, socialism and, the, on the other hand, barbarism. In other words, unless society was going to go forward into socialism, it would be thrown backwards into barbarism. Um, she was proved correct when she said this. Uh, what followed after she said was the First World War, the Great Depression, and the Second World War and the rise of fascism in Europe. Um, I think what she said is relevant today. I think it's actually no longer a cliché. I think if society continues as it is, we are going to see barbarism on a huge scale. Think about what Caitlin talked about in Australia. 30 people killed, a billion animals dead. The idea, really, that runaway climate change could make a whole country uninhabitable. Think about the floods in Jakarta, 200 people or more killed. Uh, think about the daily barrage of news stories, the fact that we're living, uh, the last five years have been the five hottest years on record. Uh, the fact that actually our existence on the existence on the planet is under threat. That is a big argument about why we need system change. The second argument you could look at about why if society continues as it is that we'll be heading towards barbarism is the simple fact that the racist and the fascist right are at their strongest level since the 1930s. Um, January marked 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz of the concentration camps and the horrors of the Nazis. 
It is horrific to think that in the country where the Nazis took power, Germany, the official opposition now in the parliament are alternative for Deutschland, who have Nazis at their core. They have a Nazi wing. So 75 years on from the Holocaust, in the very country where those horrors started, Nazis are back on the rise. And it's the same when you look around Europe. The far right and the fascist right on the rise. Obviously in Britain it's not the same, but look at what Boris Johnson's government is doing. The deportation of Jamaican nationals, despite the court telling them that they couldn't do it. Read the front page of Search Socialist Worker. Uh, we interview someone who says that if he's sent back to Jamaica, he will die. His father was murdered and he'll be murdered. Uh, this is the same government that locked out 200 child refugees only two weeks ago. The, the threat of the barbaric nature of racism and fascism today is a massive one. And this all takes place in the context of the fact that the financial forecast suggests that the world economy is heading for another recession. Economic crisis is rearing its head again after 2008. Uh, this will intensify not just the austerity and the uh, cuts to living standards that we've seen in the last 10 years, but it will intensify all the problems of society, of climate change, of the rise of the far right, and so on. Now, if that was the only picture, fucking hell, it would be a very depressing one. If that was all that was happening in society, it would, you, you know, you, even the most optimistic of us would feel very depressed. But the picture is very polarised, I think, politically. We live in a polarised society. Um, for a lot of people, 2019 will go down as a terrible year politically because of the election result. And I don't blame people for thinking that. But we have to remember as well that 2019 was a year of revolt. It was a year that the climate movement burst onto the scene. Think about it, Greta Thunberg started as a solitary teenager outside the Swedish parliament. Now there's millions who join the climate strike worldwide. Think about the global revolts that Nadia talked about. You don't even he re read about it in the press. But the fact that in country after country, Sudan, Haiti, Lebanon, Iraq, Algeria, Chile, dictators and presidents were pushed aside by mass movements. Think about that. that it, the, the, the global revolt is something we should celebrate. And it shows us that the picture is polarised. We also have to recognise, I think, that in the last year or so, we've continued to see the big resurgence of socialist ideas. Jeremy Corbyn, Bernie Sanders, Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, and so on. Um, I, for one, am very sad that Corbyn lost the election and that he'll be leaving the Labour Party. But let's not forget the legacy of the last four years. The fact that hundreds of thousands of people in Britain now consider themselves a socialist. It wasn't like that before. You used to learn that socialism was something that can't be popular in Britain. Now, much more people identify with those ideas. Look at what's happening in America with Bernie Sanders. A 78-year-old man who suffered a heart attack six months ago is inspiring young people to get involved in socialist politics, to get involved in socialist ideas. Uh, Jad said that France was probably the most exciting place to be a socialist. I agree with him. I think America's second at the moment, though. Not just have you got Bernie Sanders' campaign, 2019 saw the highest number of strike days in America for 32 years. You've got mass movements against racism, against sexism, the women's marches and so on. The point I'm trying to make, therefore, is that, that the situation is incredibly polarised. I think as well we should recognise that while we support all of those movements, Sanders, Corbyn, Syriza and so on, we want these people to win elections, I think at the same time we have to explore some of the political debates within those movements. Um, all right, we wanted Corbyn to win, we want Sanders to win. Why is it that we're not in the Labour Party then? Uh, why is it that our comrades in America are not part of the Democrats? And it's a difficult question to answer. We have to look through some important debates because in all of those examples, they share a common characteristic which says that the way to change society is to reform and to tinker around the edges of the current system that the best we can do is elect people at the top of society to negotiate with the ruling class, with the people who really want society. The bankers, the bosses, the city chiefs, the police chiefs, the people, the huge sections of society that are completely unelected but hold huge power. 
What Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn and so on advocate is to negotiate and to compromise with these people in the hope that it can bring about real change. And you see, if that is your strategy, it really says that what you have to do is you have to make your programme and your policies palatable to that ruling class. You have to get them on board. You have to get them to agree that they're going to accept your government. And therefore, it means that you compromise. It means that if you're Rebecca Long-Bailey, you do what she did yesterday, where she said that any criticism of the Israeli state as being racist is inherently anti-Semitic. In other words, throwing Palestinians under a bus. It means that if you're Bernie Sanders, you do what he did the other day, which is that at a rally where he, I'm delighted he won New Hampshire primary, the day after he made a speech saying that whoever the Democrat candidate, candidate is, all his supporters should get behind them. Now, the Democrat candidate might be Michael Bloomberg, uh, someone who is worth $40 billion and was a Republican mayor of New York, but is now running for the Democrats. I think it would be a tragic waste of potential, of, it, of the excitement that people feel for a better world if the supporters of Bernie Sanders have to line up between, behind the other, someone else who wins a Democratic nomination. I think it'd be tragic if the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this country, who were enthused by Corbyn's talk of a different kind of society, line up behind someone like Keir Starmer. I think we have to offer a different kind of strategy for those kind of people. I think we have to offer an alternative. And I think that alternative have to start by saying that now is not the time for a treat. The election result was a crushing, crushing blow, but now is not the time to retreat. Over Palestine, over racism, over climate change and so on, it's important there are people in Britain who are standing our ground. And rather than waiting for the next leadership election in five years' time, the absolute priority for anyone who's a socialist in this country has to be building the resistance. Building the climate strikes, building the stand-up to racism demo on the 21st of March, solidarity with the UCU strikes, and so on. That has to be our absolute focus, not who is le next leader of the Labour Party. The second thing I think we have to do, though, I think we have to learn political lessons. I think we have to drive those movements forward. We have to provide a strategy which can do that. But we also, I think, have to learn the political lessons of where reformism can end up. And I think the alternative to that is trying to build a revolutionary core within those movements. To build a core within those movements, a core of people who will stand principled on the key questions, who will drive the movement forward, but also have an understanding that it is the system that is the problem. It is a 1% who are taking us to the verge of climate catastrophe, who lock out refugees, who increase the amount of billionaires while ordinary people's lives get harder. It is that ruling class and the system which they sit on which is the problem. And therefore, it requires a revolutionary transformation. It requires ordinary people having the power to revolutionary and revolutionise and transform society so that it's run for people, not profit. And I think the stakes are incredibly high. I think that's what today has been about in some ways. It's recognising that the stakes are incredibly high, like Rosa Luxemburg talked about 100 years ago. Uh, the 1920s became a decade which was defined by economic crisis, the rise of fascism, and the rise of the far right. It is our duty to ensure that the 2020s, this decade, is not defined by climate chaos and the rise of fascism and the far right. And therefore, I think if you agree with that vision, you should think about joining us. You should think about joining the Socialist Workers' Party. Because the more socialists in every university, in every university workplace, campus and so on, will make a huge difference, a huge difference in, the, in the days and the months and the years to come. The stakes are high. I think we need to get organised. I think the people in this room should be part of that leadership. Because I tell you what, the Labour Party talks about who is the party leaders. In the SWP, we talk about being a party of leaders where you can all lead wherever you are. And that's why I think you should join.